Signal Watch podcast proudly presents Noir Watch. Dames, Seamuses, Hoodlums, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine the cinematic movement that rose from the dark shadows of the 20th century, explore how that tradition is carried into the 21st, and try to skip the bunk and keep it square. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. Everybody and welcome back to the Signal Watch, or I should say Noir Watch. Uh, mm-hmm. With me today is our own Justin Lincoln. Hello, everyone. Hey, man, welcome back. Thanks so much for Thanks. joining me again. Yeah, it is good to be back. This is definitely a nice diversion from the rest of the world. So uh, <laughs> glad, to, glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, this is not going to be a, us us talking about what's going on outside your window. So um, mm-hmm. you know. Sit back, relax, have have a have an hour of distraction, or however long we talk here, and yeah. enjoy yourself. Uh, but we 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 watched two very different movies, uh, not actually that different, which is why I think they pair well together. Yeah, um, and they have a lot of things in common, and many things that are not in common. Um, but uh, you had suggested nineteen nineties backtrack also known as catch fire right and i will say this uh, i know we tend to get into the spoilery details on backtrack but if i had never heard of backtrack before just the last few weeks um and i suspect a lot of people have not either uh so if you are at all interested in it i would suggest watching it first and learning as little as possible as you can because at least my viewing was just one jaw drop after another <laughs> between the production, between who's in it, um, between the story and everything in between. So there's, there's my warning. It's uh, quite a, a thing to behold. We will absolutely get into that. Yes. Um. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a 1990 film. Um, you can find it right now on Amazon. Um, mm. It's also, I think, on Tubi. That, yeah, and what I had read, and I don't know if, this is, if there's any validity, because I've not, I only watched it on Tubi, but apparently there are different versions of it out there. And I believe that the one on Tubi, it, or I should say at least the one on Tubi is supposed to be the closest to a director's cut as there is, but I've not compared it to what is on Amazon. So they may be exactly the same. I don't know. They may be, I think there's only two or three cuts. Um, and one of the, the cut that was catch fire that was released in theaters is not what I watched. Cause one, the title on the film was, was backtrack Two. Mm-hmm. Uh, as Catch Fire, it was released as an Alan Smithy film. Oh, interesting. Yes. As, okay. as Backtrack, it was released under the director. Uh, it, it, we're we're going to get into spoilers immediately <laughs> then, uh, under director Dennis Hopper. Right. The other film that we watched was Murder by Contract from 1958, which I had seen at uh, Austin Noir City in uh, 2019. Um, I don't, I, I don't think I knew literally anything about it. Uh, when I go to North city, I tend not to read up on the movies. I'm just going to let them unspool in front of me while I sit there and kind of enjoy whatever the surprise is. Um, and this one was a huge surprise on, on multiple levels. I uh, just mm-hmm. really enjoyed the heck out of it when I was watching it. Um, but both movies, uh, 
are about, or at least in part about contract killers um, right. who are both a little off kilter. Um, <laughs> and I, and I think that these movies at, at least murder by contract probably informs some other movies, including I would guess possibly aspects of backtrack. Um, yeah, but I can see that. I want to back up a little bit. Uh, and, and you had said, uh, you know, a while back I did an episode of this, of this podcast. I almost said this show, whatever, <laughs> it's a podcast, uh, where, where, uh, Simon talked about like why I love movies. And you said, Oh, you know, backtrack might not be exactly it, but it's, it's at least, you know, in part like why I love movies. And I was like, yeah, man. Um, well, we can definitely talk about that. So this is that moment. But before we <laughs> before you get into that, uh, I am drinking Lagavulin. What are you having, my friend? I have a large margarita. Oh, ah, very nice. Yeah. Very so nice. I've changed it up from the brown liquors to the, uh, <laughs> hey, the summertime. A, yeah, I'd say it's summer in a couple of days, so you're 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 on pace. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about backtrack first, because um, I, I want to hear all about w- what about this movie like really stuck out at you that because you, you came at me hard with this movie. Like, oh I, yeah, when I'm, yeah. When I'm suggesting movies for the podcast. I'm usually like, well, you know, what about this one or this one or that one? But you were like, ah, you've got to watch this thing. Yeah, and this uh, I got have to give my friend Chris Popkoff gave me. Uh, uh, tip me off to this movie um, and uh, the suggestion that I imparted of learning as little as you can is, is, is what he gave me and I think that's what I passed along to you. Um, it is, I just love these movies that seem to be made for nobody but the people who are involved in this. I mean, this feels... Uh, I have no idea who this movie would be made for other than I have a theory that it is a scam for Dennis Hopper to collect art because I think there's a lot of art in this movie. And I had recognized, I I forget the name of the artist who in here we go, Jodie Foster is based on, Mm -hmm. um, but when the uh, the LED scrolling boards came up, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember this woman being this kind of pop art phenomenon for a while. So, And I did a little reading, and it sounded like she and Hopper were good buddies. Um, so that led me to think that this is an excuse for Dennis Hopper to use studio money. <laughs> To buy art, to have this, to probably to pay this woman to create art that I'm sure ended up in, <laughs> in the Mr. Dennis Hopper household. Yeah, <laughs> living room, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, and it is a pretty, I mean, the movie is, it, I mean, it exists only for itself, it seems. And, I don't know how to describe how this movie progresses, but in a way it kind of seems like it is so unique that I wonder, I kind of wonder how much of a script there actually was and in what sort of order they shot this. I mean, it almost see it's, it's kind of seems like made up on the day is what it feels like a little bit, but there's too much of an overarching story for like that to be true. Right. But um, I mean, it's like, you know, Dennis Hopper playing saxophone. <laughs> and, well, let's, let's back it up and, and at least okay. set up what the movie is. So, sure. it, um, so Jodie Foster plays this uh, kind of con- conceptual artist who makes these kind of LED screens with, with various messaging on them. And she's worried about, you know, the speed of how fast the messages go and how many dots of, and all the things you would expect. Um, and she, on her way, leaving her gallery or wherever she's putting the things together, mm-hmm. um, she has a blowout on her fancy vintage car and right. um, pull, pulls over to the side of the road. And it just like a really 
just the the worst, not like a bad neighborhood, but like in a non neighborhood. She's basically driving past refineries, right? Um, and so she's got a, you know, there's not much of a shoulder, and so she's kind of like walking along, and she's wearing a dress, and she looks like Jodie Foster, and so she starts immediately getting harassed, and so she's like, Ugh. and and like, because well, I'm gonna go cut through the refinery to go get help. <laughs> Um, and at this point, um, she comes across a, what's basically an execution. Um, right. so she bears witness to it. And this was the first time because in the credits, uh, they show a few names that are, are big names, um, that I was like really excited about. Um, you know, it's directed by Dennis Hopper. He's starring Dennis Hopper and you're going to get Dean Stockwell and you're going to get John Turturro and Fred Ward. And, mm-hmm. and oh my God, they just dropped Vincent Price's name, and this is just before he passed. And they even dropped the name of Julie Adams, that mm-hmm. uh, 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 creature. From, I have a signed picture that I'm looking at right now of Julie Adams from Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, and anyway, it was just like that. Well, that's crazy. What a cast they pulled together. And then freaking uncredited Joe Pesci shows up. And my, like my head just like melted and I was like, what is going on? And I mean, I know at this point, Dennis Hopper has been in Hollywood for, for 25 years or so, 30 years. And he's made a lot of friends and it just felt like he just exploited the living hell out of that as well. Um, as he was directing this film. Um, but anyway, yeah. So it's Joe Pesci basically playing a Joe Pesci character. Um, uh, and you know, what else do you want to say about that? Um, no, I, I, I mean, my, your brain is melting. I mean, I'm just, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe like this. I mean, it's every, every five minutes and we'll get, as we talk about it more, we'll get into some of the other folks that show up, but I mean, you're right. It's, it's, it's like a parade of parade of stars in this and some really young people i mean like uh, i was trying to figure out how young like um catherine keener uh-huh. shows up later in this movie and she's With got so be. much hair <laughs> <laughs> she's such like 1989 hair in this thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, John Turturro is, is very young John Turturro, um, from like the Barton Fink era, maybe slightly before, more like the Miller's Crossing era. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jodie Foster, I think this is the movie that was released just before Silence of the Lambs. So it was probably shot okay. just before then. Um, and yeah. And Fred Ward, who, if you're like I, that name, I'm trying to place it. He was Remo Williams. Remo Williams. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, um, we get what, like five minutes of Charlie Sheen. Yeah. So then yeah, As, Charlie Sheen. Yeah. yeah go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Charlie Sheen shows up. Uh, I mean, she, she witnesses all of this. She, um, if I remember right, she goes to the police. Mm-hmm. Um, and Charlie Sheen shows up as her boyfriend to mm-hmm. pick her up who Charlie Sheen does not last long in this film. So right. <laughs> yeah. the hitmen played by uh, Tony Sirico and, and Turturro come to her apartment and they're going to go to shoot her, but she's gone downstairs for a glass of milk. And so they go straight up to the bedroom, not realizing that and shoot into the bed and just then the cops show up. And so they got a bail. Um, and so she's, she's just left, uh, you know, freaked out. One of the things I like about the, especially the first third to half of this movie is, um, it plays a lot like a noir, but it also mm-hmm. get Ann Benton, Jodie Foster's character is very smart. Um, she, she goes to the cops. There's no like, what do I do? What do I do? Like that scene mm-hmm. isn't in the movie. Um, you would clearly go to the cops if that occurred. Yeah. Um, she's so, a master of disguise. <laughs> he actually comes up with a fairly <laughs> clever way of, of getting out. She's being pursued at some point by, by the, the, uh, the evil Dean Stockwell. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, it also made me start converting how much money was worth in 1990. Cause she's like offering a woman $40 for a wig and her coat. And I'm like, man, that's going to get you like a sleeve in 2020. Right. Um, so yeah, anyway, it, but it's, it's, it's got this. So she's now she's on the run. Um, and the, the evil Joe Pesci calls in his, the, the, the wolf sort of character, Milo, right, right. Um, who's, who's going to clean house. Um, and, and, and find her an assassinator. And I'm, I was just wondering like how much money was supposedly being thrown at this behind Milo <laughs> because they give him this like luxury apartment in LA. They give him like all these computers and like all these resources, like with everything he's asking for, you can kind of connect the dots and just do it yourself, right. you know? Right. Um, but he's going to do it. He's <laughs> going to take care of it and at kind of the direction of Vincent Price who is the head head mob boss. Right. So anyway. Um, yeah. And I love how uh, Dennis Hopper, how Milo eventually kind of tracks her down by her, what, what would you say? Her signature wit in advertising. Yeah. Um, yes. There, there's a, a moment uh, where, um, a new ad campaign is, is rolling out. I'm trying to remember exactly how it works, but he recognizes the line in the ad campaign from her, one of her signs, her, her digital billboards. And so he, you know, tracks down that ad agency where she, she, they set it up to where she flees to Seattle for what has to be like three months, six months, something like that. I mean, long enough to get a job at an advertising agency and, clearly make your way up in the food chain enough to sit at board meetings of what's right. our new slogan going to be. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, 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 so there's some things that play kind of like weird and loose with time, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, but it feels to a certain point, like a pretty standard, but s- slightly smarter thriller, um, kind of neo noir of that era. And then at some point it takes to me a, I mean, there's definitely a lot of like kind of character stuff they do, which is, is not dissimilar to what happens in murder by contract. Mm-hmm. Um, like Turo's kind of like this geeky hitman. <laughs> um, <laughs> like he, he, he's, he's just kind of socially awkward, but not in a like threatening way, more in a like, Oh man, my car broke down. I had to call AAA, like explaining this to the other hitman, which, you know, was also kind of in the water and, and, you know, independent movies at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And anyway, I can, I can tell you where I was exactly like, okay, the movies lost me. I don't know what's going on anymore. Um, and you can probably guess exactly when that is, but um, anyway, I'm going to have you talk a bit about the movie at this point. Cause I think I've done enough recapping. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah um, I mean, I'm still just kind of flabbergasted by the, the, the fact that this thing exists. I mean, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to remember what happens when they, uh, um, when they make it to New Mexico, is it? Yeah, yeah. Which I I think they're it's so funny because I think they're in, in Taos or somewhere like this. And there's when I was a kid, we took a vacation to Taos, and there's a shot in the film that is very reminiscent to a picture that my dad took that is hanging on the wall, which is kind of amusing to look over and be like, oh yeah, apparently I <laughs> was standing exactly where uh, um, Catherine Keener and her truck driving boyfriend pull up <laughs> right <laughs> so so yeah i mean they uh, i mean he what is it he essentially kind of kidnaps her i mean it's it's clearly nowadays a very problematic tale of uh, uh i mean she, she was it she hides out it, it, and i forget does she hide out in new mexico or does she get kidnapped no she she hides out she's hiding out in new mexico so she's, okay. she goes to seattle she almost gets captured at the mini golf course 
Oh, that's right. And then she she goes to her former art teacher is is basically lives in some building and is like, look, I got to go on a trip, but you can stay in this building. Um, and the, that the art teacher is played by by uh, Julie Adams. He's only in the movie for like a minute, but they clearly were excited to get Julie Adams. Meanwhile, Dennis Hopper's character is trying to pursue her, and so, but he develops this uh, like romantic obsession or sexual obsession with her. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, because when he's looking for her, he comes across some pictures she took of herself, basically boudoir photography um, of her of Jodie Foster and lingerie. So he and he's got those like taped up on the wall of his fancy apartment, and so. He's he's gone beyond like the point of like wanting to just do his job, which is just to put a bullet in her head. Um, he and you get that feeling even by the time he's in Seattle. But by this point, um, he that instead of putting a bullet in her head, uh, he actually puts a bullet in in Turo and kidnaps her and takes her on the road um, and. Then they have a night in a hotel where it's clear there was non-consensual sex. Um, and then there's another night where the whole page turns. And for some reason, and this is where I got lost, it suddenly is consensual. Um, right. And, and like, I felt like the movie at this point just missed a scene. Like, like it just failed to explain what happened there. Cause it just cuts from like, her starting to get a little bit of the upper hand and then suddenly they're like in love and, mm-hmm. and on the run together. And that was the part that I was kind of like, wait, what just happened? Yeah. They're driving in this Jeep Car- Cherokee eating burritos, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you fall in love to a Cherokee full of burritos? So. <laughs> And that was where the movie, I was like, I feel like there was a script. And the, the original screenwriter, her name was uh, Rachel Kronstadt Mann. And she basically does not have a footprint on the internet. Like, I couldn't really find anything about her hmm. other than this movie. Um, and, I mean, he Dennis Hopper had some control of this movie. At some point, it was taken away from him and re-edited bizarrely one of the executive producers is dick clark like the oh dick clark. yeah yeah um, it was an odd thing to see at the beginning of this yeah um it was also produced by at least one woman um and yeah so i was kind of like did a woman really write this as i was <laughs> watching that go down um I mean, it just had a, like a giant cartoon question mark over my head for like, finally I was like, okay, well this is the way the movie is going. So I'm going to have to just like live with it. Yeah. You have to just kind of buckle but, up and hold on. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly there's like hostess products everywhere. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. It, it just takes a turn from being like, what's clearly like a neo noir to, um, I don't know what this is anymore, but it, it definitely still has pieces of things like high Sierra um, and, and other films like that. But, you know, kind of more of the, the couple on the run. Um, right. But it, the pivot to that movie, to me, just like it, it felt like we just ground the gears as we got over there. So, yeah. Well, at least we get a, a some good helicopter action towards. <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's the it's the late eighties, early nineties. There's got to be a helicopter uh-huh. or two. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's this is definitely a good time period for uh, helicopter fetishism in motion pictures. Yeah, I just watched the Mi- not the Miami Connection, um, Hard Ticket to Hawaii, which oh. shared a nineteen nineties era. <laughs> Uh, love of the helicopter so right and yeah. ultra lights oh um, very good <laughs> but yeah so it gets it gets just it suddenly like goes from being like this like because i watched the first 30 minutes of the movie one night 
And I was like, oh my God, I'm in. Like I got to basically to the Seattle part and I was like, this is crazy. There's all these like people showing up that I wasn't expecting. Uh, I can't believe I've never heard of this. And I kind of followed your directions as far as like not looking it up or anything. And then when I, I started it completely over and watched it, watched the first 30 minutes again. And then like, as soon as like you leave Seattle, like something in the movie just changes fundamentally. Um, and I, I really would like to know what the story is there. Now I did read a little bit that, you know, Jodie Foster didn't love working on this movie, which you she, wouldn't know. She's not like being like sullen or sulky or anything. No, no. She's her typical, very, yeah. very good Jodie Foster. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, it, it, uh, it, it just, at some point, like I was like the, the Milo character changes significantly. Um, you know, he's treated as kind of almost like this, idiot savant or something at the beginning mm-hmm. of the movie. And then suddenly it's like, once he's had consensual sex with Jodie Foster, suddenly he's just like a normal guy, but kind of geeky. Um, so yeah, I just felt like something changed in there that, that Hopper must've gotten his hands on the movie in a way that they weren't expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it would be, it would be interesting to know what kind of what, what this was originally supposed to be and mm-hmm. how this story was supposed to, to unfold originally. Cause yeah, I mean, it, it definitely takes these just kind of like hard turns. And I mean, even their relationship, like, I mean, like you said, just kind of turning on a dime is, I mean, that sort of stuff wouldn't, certainly wouldn't fly today and it was much more prevalent even as long ago as the 90s but um but yeah i mean there's you definitely at the end of this movie kind of even though i i really love this movie and and i enjoyed it from beginning to end you you quickly realize why nobody's ever heard of it is it's it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think you kind of have to be invested in wanting to see Dennis Hopper and Jodie Foster and all these kind of famous faces pop up in this just kind of strange story. And it it also kind of got me thinking that uh, at one point I started to try to write down all the noir stuff that Hopper has done, but uh, there's something just recently that I watched of his, I mean, I was thinking like, there's this, you have Blue Velvet, which is, I mean, David Lynch is, you know, David Lynch noir. I feel like everything David Lynch is, does pretty much is kind of touched a little by noir. But yeah, it, it, I was trying to think of some of Dennis Hopper's other, I guess, directorial films that have, that have been noir also. But he, he always seems to have a little bit of a foot in, in noir kind of all throughout his career and this one i'd like to go back and see if this was like the one where he had the most control had presumably it went terribly terribly wrong <laughs> so. yeah i mean and there was some line i read um when i was you know because there's not much on you know 1990s just just before people start like talking about movies on the internet because the internet's mm-hmm. not really around to like 94 95 um and you know so it's more of like retro interviews and there were some interview jody foster did when she was taught when she was doing what was it the beaver whatever the puppet movie was she did with mm-hmm. mel gibson Am I mixing and matching movies? I don't know. No, no, no. That's it. Okay. Um, yeah. But she directed it. She, you know, she's directed a lot of things at mm-hmm. this point. And so they were asking her kind of like, you know, have you been in a, had a bad experience with kind of a, an actor director? And she was clearly alluding to this movie. Oh, um, interesting. And um, Hopper himself had said at some point, like, I couldn't figure out if he was saying I had just gotten sober and was thus out of my head or he was saying 
I was a drunk who had to be sober while making this movie and was thus out of my head. So, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Oh, uh, I mean, while I was watching this, one of, I mean, one of the things that really went through my mind was, so I know he got sober at some point. What point was that? And I tried to do the math and it sounded like he had been sober for a couple of years before making this and that, I feel like that tracks pretty well that, um, that, I mean, there's this kind of weird period. I mean, whenever you've uh, never had to go through anything like Dennis Hopper, but there does seem to be this weird like period after you purge your system that you, (laughs) this seems like a movie you would make after having been, two years sober is yeah. what I'm trying to say. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's strange from beginning to end. Um, we haven't even mentioned everyone who just pops up, like literally randomly Bob Dylan just shows up. And, mm, scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, Jamie was kind of looking away from the TV at that point, And I was like, wait, 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 like backed it up. Like, I, <laughs> no, Bob no, Dylan no. Just come wandered on the, yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, uh, Tony Basile is in it mm-hmm. or Basil, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, Alex Cox, who I totally missed was in this. Um, and that is kind of about it. But the, the, the one that the kind of knocked my socks off was the, it was the, uh, Catherine Keener appearance because, um, she had been like somebody's assistant in LA and the story I heard her tell, and this is after, you know, she'd done several movies and had become the Catherine Keener we all know and love. Um, someone, whoever she was working for, when she told them, well, I, I want to go start trying to audition, had just told her, you're just not attractive enough to be in movies. Which just mm-hmm. seems like, one, rude, two, wrong. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, she's, but she's, like no doubt Catherine Keener, like already oh, yeah. she shows yeah. up in this role. Like yeah. that's clearly, yeah. Um, she's yeah. not being weird or, you know, doing any kind of weird voice, voice things or anything like that. It's very natural. And she's only in the scene for like, uh, like a minute, but it plays a pivotal role in the end. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the ending of the film feels very, disjointed from the beginning of the film, which is another thing that um, why I thought there were major rewrites at some point, but it also ties together with, as the movie is called backtrack um, with the beginning of the film is that they end up back at the, the refinery and it ends with kind of like a fireball explosion in this refinery. Oh yes. You um, know, I had, I had forgotten the ending of this film. Um, <laughs> yeah what and, a kooky way to end this thing and it's super telegraphed because they're wearing flame proof suits <laughs> as they're going through like they're not going to have like them like oh when did they have a time you know an opportunity to put on the flame proof suits like i don't i don't care what kind of goofy gangster i am if i turn around and the, the other person who I'm trying to kill and pursue is wearing a flame proof suit. And I'm staying in a refinery. I'm dropping my gun and running. Right. Like, I'm like, Oh, I know what they're about to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of bizarre. Um, but much like murder by contract, they also, it ends in a, a pipe of them, like yeah. exiting to a pipe. Yeah. So, <laughs> What a great segue. <laughs> but um, so backtrack. I loved it. Um, right up my alley. Just the right amount of weirdness. Just the right amount of I'll never see another movie like this again. Uh, for better or for worse. So I highly recommend it to anybody with the caveat that uh, it's a strange one. I think the caveat is here on IMDb. I think I saw it was at like five out of 10 stars. So <laughs> half of people like it. <laughs> yeah. That IMDb crowd though. 
Yeah. Right. No, I, yeah. It is what it is. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, you can't even find like contemporary reviews. I, I, I tried to find some mm-hmm. and, and there was like one. Um, so I don't think it even like played to reviewers when it came out. I can't imagine. Yeah. I, mean, I imagine they decided to try and bury it on Cinemax at like, you know, like after 10 PM, which is crazy because of the cast that's in it. Oh yeah. yeah. And I, I think they tried to give it a little bit of a home video push when Silence of the Lambs came out and that never really took. Um, but you know, of the people in it, like Jodie Foster and someday we can just go ahead and do a, you know, Jodie Foster love fest, but mm-hmm. she's great in this. And absolutely. Yeah. And it gets I mean, this like goofy ass movie. <laughs> Oh, it, yeah. It, and everybody's committed to it. I mean, I guess uh, Joe Pesci must have come right up. Would he have come right off of Goodfellas or is he going into Goodfellas? I'm not sure, but he's yeah. in full Joe Pesci mode. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, everybody's believable and they're kind of weird without being too distracting. And you're right, it's kind of got this indie-ish 90s like these are hitmen talking about having to call triple a sort of Mm -hmm. sort of thing but i i enjoyed it quite a bit quite a bit but yeah it's it's just weird that you've never that not you justin but we Mm -hmm. the world you haven't really heard of it in any way and you know the fact that it did get released with with two different titles with an alan smithy um you know, tag on to it probably tells us something. I would love to know what the story was with whoever Rachel Kronstadt man is. Uh, if she wants to fill us in, cause she was, she wrote the story and also has shares a credit on the screenplay with an Anne Louise Bardock, hmm. um, whoever that might be. Um, and then of course I'm just fascinated to know, like Mr. Rock and roll Dick Clark was like watching dailies of this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and going, oh. <laughs> oh, and one of the people who released it too is Best John Video, which is oh yeah, that was a real treat to see. Yeah, that was bizarre. I think one of the, I think it, it was um, around the same time. I think they would have been. I think they released uh, Dirty Dancing as well. Okay, so I, I might be wrong on that. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Oh, I will say the cinematography in this movie is really nice. Um, so it's like, a, it's one of these weirdly like competent yet unstructured slash incompetent sort of, I don't want to say it's incompetent, cause, but I mean, there's, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. There's so much talent involved in this thing and it just kind of goes, it goes wild. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the story you behind this know. thing would be. <laughs> yeah, uh, the cinematographer was Edward Lockman, um, and he, man, he has some major credits to his name. Uh, probably the most famous thing recently was Carol in 2015, uh, mm-hmm. but he did like the Mildred Pierce uh, TV series on HBO, which was really pretty. Um, he also did Carmen Electra's aerobic strip tease, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but he Eddie did like gotta so- eat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he did the limey. He did Selena. Um so he's got he's got some like mm-hmm. serious serious credits to his name. He's not um just some rando. Uh mm-hmm. he did Far From Heaven, I'm not there. So but the other movie that we watched, and this is this is the the one I brought to the table, and I was actually a little concerned because um, I had only watched it the one time by myself at, at the theater, and was like super giddy walking out, and had no one to talk to about it, um, and so I didn't have anyone to like go get a sanity check on because <laughs> um, it was this murder by contract from '58, which it, it's one, it's late in the noir cycle. Um, Two, this is like clearly a no budget uh, movie, which happened to be released by a major studio for whatever reason. Um, it doesn't have anyone that you're super familiar with in it, unless you're of a certain age. 
Vince Edwards, I believe, went on to go play uh, one of the famous TV doctors of the 1960s, um, Ben Casey. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he briefly appeared in a movie we talked about previously. He was briefly in The Killing. Um, right, and that's what I recognized him from was The Killing. Yeah, I mean, he's this, like, very New York-looking, very buff, good-looking dude. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a movie about a guy who decides he's not making money fast enough. So <laughs> what he has to do is become a contract killer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he um, just wants to buy a house. Mm-hmm. In the Ohio Valley or something like that? Ohio yeah, River Valley? Yeah, uh-huh. And he's figured out at his current salary, it's going to take him 23 years to buy the house. So he's got to <laughs> find something that's more lucrative. Right. Doesn't he, doesn't he even have like, I, I remember towards the beginning of the film when he's getting paid, he's got his little like cashier's mm-hmm. notebook of like, here's what the down payment is, you know, <laughs> minus 500, minus 500, minus 500. So, um, and of course he, he won't use a gun. Uh, he, 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 and that doesn't mean he's going to necessarily use his bare hands, but he's going to use whatever's at hand to do his murder. So he's, he has this whole plan. He's going to be the, appear as a law abiding citizen that, you know, there's never any reason to pick him up, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then as, as would occur, uh, he is given a case, um, to go, to go handle out in LA, uh, that is not what he expected. And that is probably two thirds of the movie after they kind of establish who this kind of kooky guy is. Um, yeah. Um, uh, this one felt, this might be, it, it, this might be the most enjoyable of the kind of older ones that we've watched. I mean, it just, it really checked a lot of boxes for me. I mean, it's interesting how, small and kind of scrappy this movie feels um uh i mean you would mention how he doesn't use a gun because he wants to appear as this law-abiding citizen which i thought just gave such an interesting depth to the character i mean it seemed i don't know what the right term is but it's almost like i want i kind of wonder if this is maybe one of the first Neo noirish sort of where they've already had all the tropes like well in place, and then they're kind of playing with that. I mean, because before everybody has their Colt forty five in their jacket pocket, um, so I wonder if it's if this is one of the uh, first to uh, to kind of play around with those tropes. I, I, I don't, you know, literally, I don't know. I haven't seen every film noir, obviously, but I, that feels right. And I think that in some ways Scorsese has said that this movie had huge impact on him when he saw it. And, and uh, I believe it, especially if you think Mm -hmm. about, you know, his, his early work. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think that this movie maybe without people even realizing this is kind of the original one of these ended up having a lot more impact on kind of, you know, through Scorsese, through other films um, you know, that of, of people who liked this and kind of imitated pieces of this um, and ended up imp- impacting other things. Cause it is this, you know, like I, I think in some ways when I was watching backtrack, I was like, is this Hopper trying to do the continuation of the story of Claude? Hmm. Like he's this weird, you know, like what would Claude be like had he lived? Right. Um, he's still, he's successful. You know, has he found what he's really looking for? No. So he's got to keep accumulating money. Um, and you know, he has this whole thing with women in this movie, uh, where, you know, it's, it's women, women move around too much. Like you can't trust a woman, you know, sort of thing. It's a great little couple of lines of dialogue about why he needs to be paid twice as much to kill a woman. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I do, I do think you're right. I think it points like really heavily towards what would come in some of the neo-noir, 
uh, in, in 20 years later, 30 years later. Yeah, and these, I mean, his his little L.A. handler guys are just fantastic. I mean, um, I, I really like... I really like these guys and these, I mean, this movie has such distinct personalities among all these people that, um, I mean, not to say that in some of the the previous stuff from the forties and fifties we've watched has been kind of one note sort of characters, but these characters all seem very, I don't know. This movie felt incredibly fresh. To me, and maybe it's just because it's my first time seeing it, or first oh, time no. kind of for really, me on really my second. It, it totally held up. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it. This it really feels like this could be an indie movie somebody made today, and this was like the big thing that got them famous. I mean, it, it's it's just it's so creative. And inventive. I mean, his and having your main character clearly care about his job and do it well, but he spends. <laughs> I mean, he spends so much of this movie just. Well, I've never been to L.A. I want to go to the beach. Right. <laughs> I'm going to dick around for a week before we actually yeah. do anything about this. Yeah, and um, uh, you know, we get like handheld cameras which I don't know if we've seen in any of the films from the fifties and earlier that we've watched. So, I mean, in that regard alone, it just feels different. It's, I mean, it's once we get to LA, everything is so bright. I mean, there's hardly, I feel like there's hardly a shadow in this entire film, except for maybe in the end when he's crawling through the pipes. Yeah, I, I do, you know, between um, a desire to be able to show something on TV, like that was kind of a known thing that impacted what we think of as being noir by this point, because TV couldn't handle all the shadows. Um, so, you know, think of televisions from like 1960 or whatever. Um, and then also the thing I kept thinking about was also the, the ability to shoot quickly and improvise a bit was like, did they just like blast the set with light? So, you know, well, I'm going to change the blocking, but we don't have time to to change it up. So the thing you couldn't see as much on TV, and this is something, because the first time I saw this, I saw this at the the Ritz on the big screen there. Um, A lot of the sets reuse the same walls uh, that are this like weird spackle paint. Okay. Um, Interesting. Which, yeah, you can't. You, it, it keeps it from looking flat, uh, and I, it, so it makes me think they always intended for some ex- to some extent for this to show up on TV, um, <laughs> because on on the you know the big screen you're just like these are clearly fake sets. Like this is clearly just pieces they're moving around to have. Okay, this is Mr. Moon or whatever's apartment and now this is his apartment and now this is the hallway of the LA, you know, place, but it's, it all has the same weird spackle look. Um, and when I watched it on TV this time, I totally didn't notice that except for the fact I remembered it from seeing the movie. Um, but yeah, no, I mean the, the characters, uh, you mentioned the handlers and that's Mark and George and that's played by Philip Pine and Herschel Bernardi. Um, and we talked a little bit where, you know, about the, the hit men having kind of the triple a conversations and whatnot. And this feels like, it's like the er indie hit man <laughs> conversations. <laughs> like they're not having exactly those, but they're basically sitting around for a third of the movie talking about, we don't know what's going on with Claude. Like, and and they have very different opinions. They start off on the same page and they, over the week, kind of start to drift apart. Like, George is straight up afraid of him, but he also admires him. Yeah. Mark's like, you have to kill this lady. We're all going to get killed by the mob boss if you don't take care of the hit. Right. Um, Yeah, I I really, I I really love George's, um, uh, just, 
kind of fear and confidence and admiration in Claude all throughout this thing. I mean, uh, just, I, I love that you, yeah. I mean, you have this, this one who's very like, we just need to kill her. Like, why don't you use a gun? Here's how this gun works. Doesn't it look great? <laughs> right. um, and I mean, Claude's big speech about like how, I mean, how he's concocting this wild plan towards the end to, to try to, to try to murder this, this woman in George, just being thinking this is the best thing since sliced bread. Oh yeah, uh, and he gets to participate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the extended uh, shooting bows and arrows, or shooting arrows to uh, <laughs> the target in Claude's uh, apartment is, is is really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so much. I, there's so much just joyfulness in this movie to watch. I mean, not this joyful movie, but it feels. Um. I mean, th- there's these little odd things like they go to the beach and Claude pops out of the ocean in his flippers and diving mask. It's just these little touches that, I mean, I-, I didn't really think about the fact while this movie was going on that it was apparently shot in seven days. Oh, God, I didn't know that. Okay. Which is crazy. So there's part of me that wonders if they're not, filling time because a lot of this movie is not the plot happening, not him trying to kill this pianist. Um, So it may be in that regard, it it kind of hits this very, very, very early independent, what we now think of as indie cinema sort of feel is it really is just, it's almost kind of like a hitman hangout picture. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, you I mean, you think of like later this kind of is the seeds of something like Clerks where it's just like you know, we have this location where we can film and so we're just going to have these guys talk the entire time and let's try to make their conversations interesting. And I mean, here it's interesting in space. It's it's so it's so exciting to watch nothing happened for almost the entire runtime of this thing. Um, And the score, the score is phenomenal. I mean, it's just a guitar. Mm -hmm. It was, I believe Bing Crosby's guitarist. That's right. That's what I heard. (laughs) Yeah. It, um, it has, um, what was I going to say? So yeah, so they're supposed to be uh, executing uh, Billy Williams, who is the the never seen mob boss's ex girlfriend, who is going to go mm-hmm. testify. And they do. He does. He he attempts to kill her in this like brilliant way. Like you know, when he finally gets around to actually doing it, and um, by blowing up her TV through high voltage current, like when she she turns on the TV, it's supposed to explode in her face. And this is just at the dawn of remotes for TVs that basically all they did was turn them on and would let you go up channels, which didn't matter when you only had like five channels. Right. Right. Um, so, but so, you know, the TV explodes and she doesn't actually get killed, but um, so yeah, there's, that's kind of this interesting breaking point then if they clearly had these bits of, well, we're going to have this moment and that moment to kind of drive. Cause I don't think they improvise the dialogue. It feels too, a little too scripty here and there. Right. Right. Um, I agree. But where there, but that was this, this great breaking point between Mark and George, uh, it, uh, George, like it should have worked. It should have worked. And Mark's like, it didn't <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're such great, such great characters. He's <laughs> What is it? What does Mark call him? Is it Mark that calls him Superman yeah, the entire what time? What are you gonna do, Superman? We're Superman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I I can't really recommend that one enough. I was I was really excited when I saw it. Like, okay, it's available online right now. And the the funny thing is, like you talked about the, the movie having this joy to it, and like I follow some people who I call you know classic film Twitter, and like when this was coming on Noir Alley. Uh, 
there was like this little buzz. If you like Nora Alley's been on a while, there's always, you know, a few people like, Oh, this is Ida Lupino and all of us Ida Lupino fans. Cause you know, swoon for a little bit, mm-hmm. but this was like, then there was this, like there's this energy around shit. They're going to share murder by contract. And so people who knew what it was were like really excited. And like, while it was on, like they were just tweeting the heck out of it. Like, Oh, this is such a great scene. And you know, all that. Um, so yeah, the people who know it, know it. It's, 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 it's a good, uh, kind of little cool calling card that I would encourage you to, to add to your deck. Um, no, absolutely. So here, I'll tell you something that, um, so in Laura, when we talked about Laura, um, so the woman who is killed in Laura is killed because she is wearing Laura's skivvies, right? Uh-huh. which I thought was interesting in this movie is the lady, the lady bunco cop who comes in is killed because she's mistaken for the pianist because she decides to try on her skivvies. <laughs> which you know, I, I thought totally was missed of, that. <laughs> you're, you're right. You're absolutely so right. Yeah. W- when that happens, like, Oh, well, I guess maybe, maybe that wasn't entirely uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's a uh, very early um, nod to Laura. I don't know, but um, but certainly that those that negligee or whatever or however they refer to it, it just seems to be a slightly lacy house coat. Yeah. So yeah. So um, I was really surprised. I was trying to think of if we've seen blood before. Um, I know I've, I've seen I've seen blood in in other films for earlier films. films. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of if anything that you and I had watched had blood in it, but I was pretty surprised by. I mean, not that there's gobs of blood in this movie, but as he's getting, you know, I mean, he's in a tube and getting shot at with pistols and shotguns from one direction and tear gas from another direction to see his like bloody hand flop out. I thought it was, it was interesting for me because I don't think I'd seen it before. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well now we're kind of getting into a little more realistic cinema here. Right. So at this point, the, um, the Hayes code, the Breen office, whatever, however you want to refer to it, uh, still was very much in, you know, in effect, but they, they were, you know, what, what else can we do and how can cinema separate itself from television and all these pressures were coming in. Um, and, but you know, this is definitely follows that rule of, uh, if you, you know, if you commit a crime, you pretty much have to pay for it in a movie. Like it, and it's, I, you know, I also as a comic book reader and, and knowing the comics code authority, it's interesting to see the creative things that end up coming out of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sometimes when you have no restrictions, you, you, you keep going to kind of, and I I think that's why you've, we've complained on this pod. I have anyway, complained on this podcast before about how I think like neo-noir basically had this weird thing where it drifted into like Cinemax late night at some point (laughs) because like once, once you're not suggesting sex anymore, you know what, what happens? You have a Malibu Bay film. Um, so, you know, but with, with the violence, you know, at this point they are showing, you know, there were some fairly violent movies. Like we should watch narrow margin at some point. Um, you know, but that's all fisticuffs and that's in, but I think, you know, if you can get away with it to the Catholic league or whoever's running the Breen office at this point, you know, a bloody hand of the, of the, you know, killer we've been watching who we've been rooting for this whole time. It's gets down oh, definitely. To the whole, um, like, wait, wait a minute. Wh- who am I cheering for? One of the things, this is years ago. I watched a thing on psycho and whoever the expert was, who was talking about psycho was like, yeah, you have this moment where you're totally like anxious for this guy. Who's a killer to get rid of the body. And you're like, you're with him in this moment of like, you got to sink that body. You got to get rid of that body before anybody <laughs> finds it. And it's like, that's really weird, right? Like, <laughs> it's really good directing. And the yeah. same thing I think is true here. You're, you're, you're with all three of the kind of criminal guys. Like, you can understand George's standpoint and Mark's. And certainly, like, you're like, Claude, just kill her. You're figured out, buddy. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, and then, of course, uh, 
yeah can't you can't actually have that ending in one of these movies so. no. but I, I i thought it was interesting that this is at least it, again maybe it kind of goes with the changing times but the uh the hooker in this movie you i don't think they make i mean th- i don't think they ever flat out say what she is but it is very much not hidden i felt I mean, less so than we we've, we've seen in the past. That yeah. You know. So I, I I agree. Um, they all but say she says you know my day job is being a secretary, and then there's like dot dot dot, and by night how much you know please leave the money on the bedside table sort mm-hmm. of thing, where they code it even more in earlier films and in studio films where they often are like taxi dancers and whatnot, and you really have to read between the lines to figure out what they're actually saying that, you know, and there's a lot of hookers in a lot of noir based on how many people are like, you know, dime a dime a dance girls and whatnot. Um, but this is like probably the most overt, like I've come to your room for the evening. Sorry, I was late. Not right. like the guy meets the girl while they're having a cup of coffee or whatever. Um, so yes, it was, and, and it was interesting to read into kind of the sexual politics of everything that was going on through that of, you know, his clear issues with women that he's, he's trying to kind of put up a front on. He's lied about having a girlfriend in Cleveland at the beginning of the movie. Um, you know, and a couple other things like that. So, but he's, you know, he's, he's done the job. He thinks he's done the job. So now he's going to celebrate and he's (laughs) not good at it. Nope. So, yeah. Interesting film. Yeah, yeah. Really, really fun to watch. I mean, just a, just a great... I mean, we, I don't think we've watched any bad movies on here, but this is definitely uh, pretty top tier in my book. Um, well, I will be honest. This is one that when I walked out of the theater, I was like, Justin would like that movie. So I, I was very excited to get an opportunity to, to show it to you. And I thought it happened to be like the, the timing on it with backtrack was. Oh yeah. yeah I think you, I, yeah, I think you had mentioned that it was going to be on TCM and I read the, the, uh, uh, the synopsis. And I was like, well, holy moly, I just watched backtrack. What a perfect, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a perfect double feature this thing is. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I recommend both of these movies for very different reasons, but uh, but they both feel. I mean, they're really both right up my alley. I mean, they're both they got this real kind of indie-ish sort of just made. Neither one of these movies could have possibly have been made to try to make money, and not that that's the root of all evil, but I mean somebody loved these movies for them to get made. And that's, that, that's real. I mean, that goes, that's 75% for me in liking a movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I completely agree that these, the, these were labors of love and, you know, like we're going to make a, you know, put on a picture show, you know, sort of thing, (laughs) which is Mm -hmm. weird to see all these like studio stars and backtrack versus these are all a bunch of people who ended up kind of, in television and, and, and whatnot, you know, as their careers for, although Billy, the woman who played the pianist, Billy Williams, um, Eddie Muller said on there, he had no idea who Caprice Tor- Toriel was, didn't know anything about her. And that, that is a guy who has done his research. So it's interesting also how some people just kind of like surface into a movie and then disappear again. Yeah. Um, and she's good. I mean, yeah. she's, she's super effective. Yeah. Um, so he was like basically begging the television audience. Like, and so I would be tell you guys, if that happens to be your great aunt or something, please find Eddie Muller's uh, Twitter account and tell him, uh, you know, who, that, you know, who Billy Williams was. Um, anyway, I think that's about it for this evening. Thank you so much once again. And yeah, thank uh, you. we'll, we'll do it again soon, man. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a great, great one, and we'll be back. Bye, everyone. Bye.
wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotis. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to drop on by the Signal Watch blog where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. You can drop comments on this podcast and let us know what you think. We do have a Signal Watch Patreon, and if you're so moved, we'd most certainly appreciate your support. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind.